Well, good evening, good evening, good evening. Praise the name of the Lord. <clears throat> Perfectly, everybody's doing well today and uh, looking forward to finishing up this uh, first book of Timothy. I mean, I'm sorry, Peter, first book of Peter. And good evening to everyone, Cynthia, good to see you, Darlene and Rita, all right, good to see everybody tonight. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 5 is where we'll find ourselves on tonight and have a chance to finish up 1 Peter uh, on this evening and uh, yeah, see how the Lord will will guide our steps uh, on tonight. Um, just, I mean, this whole process of just going so meticulously through uh, the the scriptures has been just enormously powerful, and uh, these uh, last few uh, letters, epistles that we've been traveling through, God has just been opening up our understanding, blessing us in just extraordinary ways. Um, it's just been very very good. So we're grateful for that on um, tonight, this Wednesday, and thanking God for another chance we have to dig into the Word, study the Word, learn more about Him. And apply it to our lives, because guess what? When we apply it, we become better Christians. And realistically, um, just applying God's word and living off of it, it makes life easier. It really does. It just makes things a lot easier. Um, not that it doesn't mean you won't have tough times, but as you go through the tough times, now you got grace, you've got word to sustain you through it and to be able to help you make it through. So on tonight, we'll get... Um, into uh, 1 Peter chapter 5 and uh, hopefully you'll get, get there in your text and it's getting cold outside I hope if anybody's been outside it is, the temperature is dropping like crazy and here we are on April 21st I believe it is uh, and it's snowed in some parts of Maryland today unbelievable just a constant reminder that God is in full control. He does what he wants to do when he wants to do it. Praise the name of the Lord. All right. Well, uh, Bible's in hand. Everybody get ready for this evening. Hopefully you've had a chance to tune everybody in, all your family members and friends that you want to connect to the Bible study tonight and uh, help them to come and study along with us. You can forward them the link and tell them, come on, get on time for a Bible study and uh, we'll study First Peter tonight. Well, let's look to the Lord in prayer as we get started for this evening. Eternal God, we are thankful for your amazing grace and for the peace that you give us each and every day. We do pray, Heavenly uh, Spirit, that you will uh, be with us in the midst of our time of study tonight, that you will open up the scripture to our understanding. Help us, Lord God, uh, that we might be able to apply it to our lives, that we might understand it better. Uh, that we might just have a stronger grasp on your scripture so that we can be stronger Christians in you. And not only that, God, that we can also teach others. So, Lord, open up our understanding. Bless each one on the call tonight, each one that's tuning in via live stream um, or Facebook or other platforms. Uh, we just pray that you would bless them in their uh, walk along this journey with us as well. as well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, amen. All right. So, in this book of 1 Peter, um, hopefully you have uh, been journey, journeying along with us. And uh, in this uh, book here, we have had a three-word summary, which is the, what is the book all about in three words? Patience and suffering. Uh, Peter is the author, obviously, of this uh, particular letter or epistle. And I've uh, been talking about patience and suffering. He started off in, as we broke the book down, we looked in chapter one, and that dealt with the salvation of the believer. Then in chapter two, it was the sanctification of the believer. Then in chapters three and four, he dealt with the submission of the believer, how important it was for the believer to be in submission. He looked at the um, uh, servants and masters and husbands and wives, looked at all this concept and actually he'll even hit it back again but again how important it is to be in submission to one another all of this again helps grow us uh in patience in suffering and so uh tonight uh chapter five the final chapter deals with the suffering of the believer so we've seen the salvation the sanctification the submission and now the suffering of the believer in chapter five. So uh, he picks up here in chapter five, and you're going to hear um, 
<laughs> well, I'll we'll, we'll, we'll walk you through. How about that? I don't want to get, get too far ahead. Um, but again, starting off, talking to the elders. The elders who are among you, I exhort. So he has an encouragement, uh, charge, if you will, to the elders who are amongst the body. Now, the elders, typically speaking in the, the biblical sense, um, were those that were in leadership uh, because they used the older people uh, were in those roles of leadership. And uh, in addition to those that were in leadership, they had or should have a level of honor and respect and deals with that. But for them specifically, he says to the elders, um, those in leadership, uh, I exhort you, I am a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ. So in other words, to those who are uh, who elders, who are leaders uh, of the fellowship in the church. He says, look, first of all, I'm a fellow elder with you. In other words, I'm talking to those who we're on common ground. Um, I'm also, I'm a witness. And uh, I'm a witness of the sufferings of Christ. I was there, I witnessed, I saw what Christ went through. Now, I can't tell you how valuable, how precious that is in that um, it's one thing to to hear a story and tell it that you heard, but it's a whole nother thing to get encouragement. Watch this in our suffering from someone who witnessed Christ suffer. And he says, look, I'm a witness of the sufferings of Christ. So when I, when we talk about you know, comparing our suffering to Christ's suffering, you know, um, theologically speaking, as a student of theology, we can study it and say, oh yeah, well, he went through a lot and we can grasp it from that sense. But we can never grasp it from studying books the way Peter grasped it from his literal presence being there, being an eyewitness, a firsthand front line witness to the sufferings of Christ. And he says, look, I'm a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed. And I love the way he lays this out because he says, look, first of all, he connects with them in that I'm an elder too, just like you are. So I'm talking to you, we're elders together. We're leaders together, okay? But I'm also a witness of the sufferings of Christ, okay? So I was there when Christ went through and I witnessed what he went through, okay? And he, and he gives you that. But then he says, look, not to leave you on a sad note, but I'm also a partaker. I'm also a part of those who will... Uh, obtain the glory of God uh, in the end. So I'm a partaker of the glory that will be revealed. So he pushes and points us ahead to, as elders, as that one himself who has witnessed the sufferings of Christ, but also <laughs> I'm of the group, I'm of the fellowship of those who will experience the glory of God when it is revealed later on. Okay, so he gives this kind of credentials almost um, to those in his encouragement and his exhortation to them of who he is and what his position is and even why he has a, uh, a sense of authority or a sense of uh, commonality to even share this, this um, encouragement with them. You know, it's one thing to get it from somebody who heard it or, you know, again, credentials mean a lot when someone's trying to encourage or exhort you to a particular thing. So he says to them, listen. Shepherd the flock of God, which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly. Okay. Notice all, all the credentials and all the stuff he laid out there at the beginning so that he could come back to the elders, so he can come back to the leaders and say to them, shepherd the flock. I, I love this. I, I but everybody, tune in. I know I know what you just did. When you heard that word, shepherd, you just cut that off. But let me help you with this one. Let me help you with this one because this is something I believe in church life we can grow a lot in. This is an area I believe in, in churchology, if I can say it that way. We have a lot of room for growth in. And if we get this, in, and even in our formation and our structure of our churches, it, it can literally change how your church functions. But watch this. Okay, so now let's say I'm talking to the elders, I'm talking to the leaders, I'm talking to, um, and I, I'm, I'm going to throw in different classifications when we talk about elders. Okay, elders here, he's talking about those, those leaders in the church. That's who he's, he's referring to, the elders, the leaders in the church, the pastors, the deacons, 
um, the ministers, the elders, those who are ruling and, and leading and have the spiritual leadership of the church. But can I expand that just a bit? When we talk about the elders, when I'm talking about leaders, period, I'm talking about ministry leaders, okay? Now, let me, let me just, uh, just bear with me. Let me, let me add in ministry leaders. Let me add in those that are, that are leaders of the ushers ministry and those that are leaders in the children's ministry and those that are leaders in, I don't know, the teller's ministry and, and those that are leaders in the greeter's ministry, those that are leaders in the various ministries, even the fellowship ministry or the pastor's care ministry or whatever ministries you have. Let's take all of those leaders and, and let's address them with this first statement. Shepherd the flock, okay? Watch this. Now, we know, we understand, hey, that's the pastor's job. The pastor's going to shepherd the flock. What, what do we mean by shepherd the flock? It means to love them, care for them, lead them, guide them, okay? Watch this. Now, the pastor's going to do that. The pastor, obviously, we're talking the pastor, the, the leader, the, uh, the, 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 the bishop, the, uh, the overseer. Shepherd the flock. Take care of the flock. Take care of the people that are under you. But, but what, if, what if we, watch this, what if we expand that and instead of just thinking that the only one that has that responsibility is the pastor, let's also grab that mentality and assign some of that shepherding to ministry leaders. So now watch this. So now in your ministries, if you're a ministry leader, if you happen to be a leader of a particular ministry, shepherd those in your ministry. Well, what do you mean, Pastor, shepherd them? What I mean is love them, care for them, check on them, pray for them, encourage them in your ministry. Now, watch this. If we have that happening all the way down from the top, I'm talking about the pastor is shepherding the flock. The pastor is loving on his members. The pastor is leading and guiding his members. The pastor is... I'm checking on his members and, and the pastor is doing all his part, but watch this. But we're also seeing it happen in every single ministry in the church. It's happening in the children's ministry. It's happening in the youth ministry. It's happening in the young adult ministry. It's happening in the seniors ministry. It's happening in, in the, the, I don't know if we got so many ministries in the churches. It's, it's in the red haired ministry. It's, it's in whatever ministry, but in every single ministry, every leader is literally shepherding those that are in their ministry. They're loving on those that are in their teller ministry. They're loving on those that are in their fellowship ministry. They're checking on them. They're encouraging them. And it's happening all the way down. It literally changes the fabric and fiber of how the church functions and how people are cared for and how they care for one another. So, but, but Peter says, okay, let me stay with the, the fullest context of it. The fullest context of it, those who are in leadership, those who are spiritual leaders, those who are the pastors and, and, the, and the elders and rulers, shepherd the flock of God, which is among you, serving as overseers. Notice the term. I'll, I, I, I'm trying to take my time to walk you through this. When he says serving, watch, he says shepherd the flock, the first word coming out of that is serving because shepherding is serving, okay? Shepherding is not laying back, kicking back, and just waiting for everybody to do stuff for you or playing golf every day. No, <laughs> shepherding is serving. Serve the flock. Serve those who are among you. Serve them as overseers, watching out for them, overseeing them, looking out over them, over care, overseeing, okay? Looking out for them. And guess what? Again, let me go back to my first thing. If this is happening in all the ministries, whoo, wow, you've got a very strongly connected church and body of believers because everybody is looking out for everybody. There's leaders looking out for those there's ministries. There's deacons looking out for those family care groups or ministries. There's a pastor looking out for, you know, the church and the flock and everybody's looking out for each other. Now you've got a very strong church, a very strong, who have, that, watch this, that all have a shepherd's heart, that all have a heart to look out for and look over and oversee those that are under them and, and that are amongst them. And so he says, elders, I exhort you, I encourage you. He says, look, shepherd the flock of God, which is amongst you. And I, here's another thing. I, I, I breeze past it, but let me back up. Let me, let me put it in reverse and back up. Shepherd the flock of God. 
That's, that's key. That's important. Don't forget those that are amongst you, those that are under you, pastor, bishop, overseers, leaders, those that are under you are not yours. They're God's. They're, they are the flock of God that you and I have been entrusted to oversee. Okay? So we're on assignment as pastors and elders to oversee those who belong to God. Now, let me say this. This understanding of this help, should help the pastor, the bishop, the leader, the elder. It should help them to understand that they should not take advantage of the sheep because the sheep belong to God, okay? So in other words, if I leave you to watch my sheep, okay, and I come back and say, you know, I'm, I'm going to be out of town for a couple of days. I'll be back a couple of days. I leave my sheep with you. When I come back, my sheep should not have been sheared. In other words, all the wool should not have been cut off of them by the time I get back. That means you you abusing my sheep yeah. <laughs> while I'm away. Watch this. They're not your sheep. You just were you were just left there to oversee them while I was gone out of town. So in other words, don't be fleecing the flock because they don't belong to you. Those are God's people. Those are that's God's flock. Uh, I hope this is sinking in. Uh, and so we got to be careful because these are God's. This is the flock of God, which is among you. We're serving them as overseers, not by compulsion, not forcefully, but lovingly leading, willingly, not doing it because somebody made you do it, um, but you're doing it willingly. And not for dishonest gain, but eagerly. I love it. So you're not, you're not doing it for dishonest gain. You're not doing it to try to get over um, you're doing it because you've been called to it and because God has raised you to it and you have a love and a passion for the flock of God to oversee and to fulfill the assignment that God has left you to see, to, to, to do. I, I, I was, um, someone sent me an article just uh, yesterday, I think it was, of a, uh, and of course, you know, they always going to get you, pastor, know this, if you do something wrong, they're going to get you and they're going to blast you on media. So they sent me this, this article of this pastor who had um, taken all this money from this uh, PPP loan and all the stuff they spent, they had all laid out all the money he spent, where he spent it on, all the stuff he did, had, you know, all the information, had picture of his church, all that, had picture of him, all his little Sunday best and all that. And now he's going to jail. So he can be starting a prison ministry because of what, you know, all the, the, this, this fraudulent stuff that he had done. Um, part of it is fraudulent on the government, but then other things um, suggest that there may have been fraudulent on other areas in other areas as well. But and I, I'm not saying that to, to blast him. I'm saying that as a as a as a result of the role that we have, we have to be careful that we walk in integrity because it becomes a negative reflection on the kingdom of God. Watch this, even if it's something that we're not doing in the church. Okay, so we've got to be careful with that, and we got to be careful that we take care of the people of God because many, many, many people have been hurt in the, in the house of God by the leaders in the house of God, and they've been abused, misused, fleeced by the, the leadership in the house of God as opposed to being lovingly cared for and shepherded according to what Peter is encouraging the elders to do, okay? So it's not for dishonest gain. Yes, your servant is worthy of his hire. He's working. You're doing your, 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 you know, doing your ministry. You're committing your life to it. You deserve to get paid. No doubt about that. Okay, no doubt about that. That's in the scripture is legitimate. But again, that's but you're working for it. You're 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 doing the labor, uh, and you're being compensated for the work. But if you're not doing no work, I think scripture says one man that don't work shouldn't eat. Okay, so there is work to be done. So you got to do the work. And so as pastors and leaders, we have to do the work um, in our leadership. And part of the part of the work is obviously our, in our study of the Bible. Uh, our work is in the ministry to the families. Our work is in the, the leadership of the, uh, the church itself, uh, the visionary approaches and all the other things that come along with that. Some of us being a CEO uh, of the of the uh, kind of operating as a CEO. You got all kinds of things going on in the church. You got this operation, that operation, business stuff going on here, there. You got staffing, you got all kind of issues, but well, you got to do the work. You know, you you got to you got to take care to do the work, uh, and in doing so, it's not by dishonest gain that you are 
being compensated, all right? And I think also, not just for the pastor, I think also sometimes the church member needs to understand that being a pastor is work, okay? It is work. It's not, if, if, if a, let me say it like this. Let me, let me qualify my statement. If the pastor is shepherding the flock, if the pastor is actively involved in leading the people of God and uh, ministering uh, as, as scripture encourages him to, he's going to be busy, okay? He's going to have work to do. Uh, and so, and when he has work to do, he, he needs to eat. I mean, you can't, you can't expect them to do all the work and not be able to eat, not be able to get paid. Um, so the, 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 on the flip side, from the membership side, you understand, pastors deserve to get paid too, okay? And, you know, some people argue, well, how much you got to get paid? Well, ask, let me ask you, how much is it worth for him to watch over your soul? What's the value of that? What's the value of him pouring the word of God into your life week after week, Sunday after Sunday? What's the value of that? Um, so, I mean, he deserves to be paid and compensated as well and, um, you know, taken care of as well, that he has to feed his family, he has to take care of his things as well. Now, think about it, um, and I, I hate to make any kind of comparisons, but I mean, for some, you know, you, you, you're, you're doing whatever you're doing, you're getting paid, you, you got benefits, you got this and that. Why shouldn't the pastor? He, he's committed his life to this um, yeah, they, they should be paid as well. Servant is worthy of his hire, all right? Don't, don't muzzle the ox, the scripture says. And so let him, let him uh, Paul says he, he, he deserves to eat from the work of his labor, in essence. And so um, the, the shepherd is encouraged here. I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, the elders are encouraged here to shepherd the flock, um, not by compulsion, not for dishonest gain, but, but doing so eagerly, not as being lords over those entrusted to you. Again, there's that idea. They're not yours. They're, this is God's flock. They've been entrusted to you. I can't, I can't, I cannot overemphasize how uh, imminent that needs to be upon the thought of everyone who enters into the ministry. Everyone who wants to step forward and say, hey, I want to pastor, I want to lead. You need to understand there is an issue of accountability when you step into that position, when you've been called into it, and when you accept that calling, there is an issue of responsibility and accountability. And your accountability is not literally to man, even though there is a level of accountability to man, but the highest level of accountability that, that we have is our accountability to God, because we're going to be held accountable for the leadership of those we have been entrusted by God to care for. And I never, ever want to take that lightly. As we lead, as I lead as a pastor, all the people that are in the congregation, all the people that are under whatever tutelage that God gives me, it is a privilege, but it is a weight of responsibility. And I want to make sure that I'm doing the best I can to look out for them, to shepherd them, to guide them, because I've only been entrusted to shepherd. I'm, I'm a steward of them until I can present them back to God or until they leave my fellowship and go to another fellowship. So whatever time, whatever season, if they're with you, um, pastor, leader, elder, you're responsible for them. You're going to be accountable to God for them. Okay. And so he says to us, don't, don't Lord over those. Don't, don't be, you know, sticking to us. I'm, I'm your, I'm in charge. You know, it's not no charge. We are, we are shepherd leaders. Um, and leading in love, leading in care, leading those that don't belong to us, leading God's flock who he has gone away and entrusted to our care until he returns. And we don't know when he's going to return for them or for us. Uh, and so we need to be faithful and make sure we're found faithful in doing this on a regular basis. Um, now, he says, um, and when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive a crown of glory that does not fade away. Okay, there's a reward. When all the accountability is done, after you've overseen and you've taken good care of the flock that God entrusted into your care, once he does appear, that's the good shepherd, that's the, the chief shepherd, okay? Uh, as, as, as pastors, we're under shepherds, okay? Uh, we're, we're just taking care while he's gone. He, when he comes back, if we've been faithful, then he'll give us a, our reward for our faithfulness. 
for our accountability is a crown that does not fade away. Okay, now here's the contrast. The contrast is for those that are fleecing the flock, taking advantage of those who are, who they're leading, they're trying to get a crown right now. Okay, they're trying to get a crown of gold right now that fades. They're trying to get all the gold, all the money, all the silver right now, all the stuff right now that fades away. But our efforts and our energy shouldn't be for obtaining the earthly crown. Our efforts and our energy should be towards obtaining the, watch this, the approval of the chief shepherd so that he can crown us with a, with a crown that does not fade. An eternal reward from the Lord Jesus Christ because we have been found faithful in shepherding the flock. Now, let me, let me take that. I went from, the, from, the, from one end to the other and I really kind of focused and put it on the pastor there. But, but what if, again, like I said, what if that same attitude is carried out throughout the church through all the church leaders that each of them understands as a leader, you're still responsible to lead those in your ministry who belong to God. And you should also lead in the same way, not by compulsion, not by force, but willingly, okay, again, willingly, uh, with love and your leading and guiding, understanding that you're going to also be held accountable for how you led those that were under your leadership, okay? Because again, these are gods and we've been entrusted. It's a stewardship. Even as a leader of a ministry, you're, it's a stewardship that you're leading other people in the house of God. Now, if we can bring all of the leadership and all of the elders and all of those under that responsibility and that thought process, I want to even throw in the parents. Can I throw the parents in there too? If, what if we can get even the parents to have this attitude about the children that are in their houses that they have to raise up? Those are, technically, those are God's children that have been entrusted to your care that you're responsible to lead and guide and shepherd. Shepherd your flock, whether your flock is two, whether it's one or whether it's six or ten, shepherd them in love, lead them, because you're responsible and you're going to be held accountable as a parent leader, okay? So this goes all the way through, and if we can ingrain this into our whole societal view, it changes the way things occur, because I could even move this and say, let's take it to your job and those that you're responsible for on your job. Shepherd them. Trust me, when you are shepherding people under you and around you, it makes for much more peace. When you're trying to lead by compulsion and authority and, and domination, it creates much more trouble because as you push, they push back. But as you love and as you care, watch this, your love and your care and your concern and your shepherding of them helps them to understand I'm appreciated here, I'm loved here, I'm cared for here, even as a sheep knows he's being loved by his shepherd. Y'all still here with me? So I'm trying to help us to see where this whole concept, if we can incorporate it into all the dynamics of the church and our home and our family and even on our job, this changes a whole lot of things, okay? It really literally does. And watch this, and in the midst of all of the troubles of the world, it gives us peace because we have peace to be able to do what God has called us to do. So we can endure the sufferings of the world because we're leading in love and shepherding according to the scripture. Y'all still here with me? Wow, this is really good stuff. So he said, and ultimately we, we're, we're gonna obtain the crown. Once, once we uh, give account for, we, we, we obtain a, a crown that does not fade away. Verse five says, now to, to the younger, he shifts from the address of the elders now to the younger, those that are not elders, those are... Um, of the, the younger persuasion. Uh, likewise, you younger people, what do they do? Submit yourselves to your elders, okay? Respect the elders. And this whole idea of submit, again, is not this idea of being forcefully um, pushed down and held down, no. It's the idea of voluntarily placing yourself in humility under their leadership. Wow. Listen, I know it's a whole new day and people, young folks, they, you know, they want to do what they want to do. But there is value in what we learn growing up of being young people and being children and, and humbling yourselves under the leadership of elders and respecting those that are elders above you. So he tells the young people, submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you be submission to one another and be clothed with humility. Wow. The clothes that, the, that he's calling the young to put on is clothing of humility. 
Not clothing that says, hey, oh, you old fart. I'm just as big and bad as you are. That's not humility. That's arrogance. I'm faster than you. I'm stronger than you because I'm young. That's arrogance. Humility says, look, I keep my strength, my power, and all of that under control, and I'm willing to place it under your leadership. You might be slower than me. You might be weaker than me, but I'm willing to follow. Because listen, young people, listen to this one. Old people got a lot to teach us, okay? Our elders have a lot to teach you. You can learn a lot from your elders, good and bad. But if we're, if we're so busy trying to lead and we don't even have the wisdom to lead as young people, then we're, we're going to find ourselves out there and before you know it, you, you won't know what to do. So the idea is humbly submit yourself to the elders, okay? First of all, those that are of older age, but also even more importantly, if you look at it in terms of the, the context of leadership, spiritual leadership, submit yourselves unto the spiritual leadership, okay? Humble yourselves under the spiritual leadership because guess what? Here is the deal as it relates to the leaderships in, church, in your church, okay? Now, this is depending on if, if everything is in biblical order, all right? If it's in biblical order, the pastor or leader you have is ordained to be there by God, okay? God has ordained them to be there. Now, I do know this. Every leader in a church is not, has not been put there by God. Some put themselves there, okay? Uh, as, as, as the old saying is, some were called, some were sent, and others just went. OK, so everybody is not called. OK, everybody in that role has not necessarily been called. But for those who are called to that position, they are there by the authority of God, by the calling of God. And God has put them there. Now, it doesn't mean you've got to love them and, and they all going to be the best that you want. But submit to them anyway, because God has put them there in your life and overseers of you for a reason, for a purpose. You may not understand all of what they're doing or why they're doing it but if they've been put there by God trust me God is leading them and God is going to direct them okay now and then again this is provided that they are staying in the will of God because you know there are people who have been called and they have drifted away from the will of God it happens it's just hum we're human <clears throat> but again if they're if they've been called to the position they've been put there by God they've got responsibility by God they've got empowerment by, by God they receive vision from God they're leading by God you might not understand it all you may not get it all but submit to them anyway he says submit to them you already, submit to their leadership in humility with a humble spirit submit to their leadership okay close yourself with the humility why because God resists the proud but he gives grace to the humble Wow, I love it. Watch this. For those who want to be proud, prideful, God resists you. So when you want to jump up and be big and bad and jump above that leader, above that elder, above that pastor, God resists you. So this is one of the things I learned as well about being in pastoral leadership. I don't really have to fight no battles. I just let God do it because I'm, this is not really my church. This is God's church. So if I, I got that understanding, God, I'm, I'm an under shepherd watching your church. And if th th things get out of order, people get out of order, I just go to the boss and say, boss, stay out of order. And it's his church. So he will resist the proud that he might put them back in order. Okay. And, and, but watch this, but those who are humbled and, hu and, and walking in humility under that leadership, watch this, God gives grace. Even when things aren't going well or, if, or the way, he gives grace to the humble, okay? Grace is given to the humble, but resistance is given to the proud. Wow. I'm saying a whole lot. This is, good. This is a whole good lesson on whole churchiology, okay? Uh, ecclesiology, um, uh, the study of the church. Yeah, this is good stuff for us to understand, and it's good stuff for the development of our church structure, and the development of our interactions as it relates to leaders and members in ministries and in the church. Because one, the, the, the elder has to understand their role, but also the member has to understand theirs. And we all have to understand we're all a part of the plan of God, and God has the order and the structure, and we just need to follow that. Okay? So, um, therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Y'all hearing this? Young man, young woman, aspiring leader, humble yourself 
watch this, under the mighty hand of God. Now, first, he says, he told us, right, the young people, um, be submissive. All of you be submissive one to another. But watch this. Now he says, and he, he talks about, you know, God resisting the proud, but giving grace to the humble. And he says, now, humble yourself under the mighty, that is the strength and the powerful hand of a mighty God who has all power. So your humility, watch this, when you're humbling yourself under your elder or your pastor or your leader, you're literally humbling yourself under the mighty, powerful hand of God. Because guess what? They're just an under shepherd, a space holder, a, uh, uh, how do I say this? They're a substitute uh, uh, in place under the mighty, powerful hand of God. So your submission to your leader is literally a submission to God. Because God put them in place. Ooh, Jesus is good stuff. Now, watch this. That applies from children to parents, too. You didn't choose the parents. God chose you to be that child, and they chose them as parents for you. Humble yourself under your parents. Don't jump up and buck at your parents. No, no. Humble yourself because your parents are representatives of God on your behalf. Okay? They're the overseer for you. Oh, on God's behalf. And so humble yourself. Watch this. Under the mighty hand of God, understanding you can't resist God. You can't overrun God. And so you can't overrun that man of God. You can't un overrun that leader because they're, they're not really the leader. They're just the under shepherd. It's God that you're resisting. And when you go against God, God pushes back. And it don't take much for him to push you and just wipe you out. And so watch this. So resist yourself under that leadership. Resist that and humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. And watch this. That grace we talked about when, when, you, when you're acting in humility, God gives grace to exalt you, to lift you up in due season. Okay? In due season, God will raise you up that, that you might be sitting in that seat of, of authority, that you might be sitting in that seat of pastoral membership. I can tell you, even for myself, when I came coming up in uh, ministry, uh, this pastor that I sat under, my, my, my first pastor that I sat under when I was uh, came into the ministry, um, I mean, I, I just, whatever he needed me to do, I did. I mean, when we go to the church and I clean the floors and sweep and, 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 and whatever we needed to do, mop floors and, uh, you know, whatever, didn't matter. Whatever it was that needed to be done, I did it. Um, then, you know, as, as I did whatever was necessary, did whatever was needful, and then when I came from there and I came to my next church, um, whatever they needed me to do. I mean, um, we need somebody working in youth. I didn't say, hey, youth not my thing. I didn't say that. No, we need somebody working in youth. I'm here to serve, okay? I'm, let me just tell you the mentality of a servant. A servant doesn't say, well, you know, I've, I've only been called to um, a certain kind of ministry and that's all I'm going to do. No, I'm here, God called you to serve the kingdom of his kingdom, not yours. I'm, can I, I'm going to talk to some pastors and preachers right now, some people, especially my upcoming preachers, if you're listening out there. Serve doesn't have, you're serving God's kingdom. We, we ought not be putting our own parameters on, oh, I don't prefer to be, no, don't, it's not about your preference because this ain't your kingdom. It's his kingdom and we're, we're privileged to be able to serve in it. So when my pastor said, hey, we need somebody to work with the, you know, work with the youth. Okay, I'll go work with the youth. Go give it, give it all I got. Do the best I can with you. Oh, we need somebody to, you know, over here, we need somebody with the young adults. Okay, I got that. Oh, we need somebody to handle this. Okay, whatever you need. Hey, I'm going out, I'm going, you know, preach out of town. I need, can, can somebody drive for me? I got you, I'm going to drive for you. Whatever it was, because I, I was, I wasn't the leader. And so therefore, but I respected my leader and I honored my leader and I humbled myself under my leader, understanding that my leader, my pastor, he was the representative of God on my behalf. And, and watch this. And in due season, God began to raise me up. Now, I'm not saying this as any braggadocious thing, but it literally happened just like the scripture says. As I humbled myself and I did whatever it needed to be done, I even ended up actually for a, for a season running the singles ministry. And I was not single. I was very much married. 
but we needed somebody to handle the singles ministry. So I went and handled that too. It's not about what I wanted to do. It, even now, it's not about what I want. It's about what God wants, and it's about serving his kingdom. And so for my up-and-coming um, young ministers, listen, whatever needs to be done, do it. Don't be talk, sitting around talking, well, I'm waiting on my opportunity. I, all I want to do is preach. That's all I want to do is preach. Well, you know, you might not get a chance to preach. Depending on what your pastoral setup is, you may not get a chance to preach, especially not in church, you know. Um, hey. Pastor said, we need somebody to, to go out on the street and evangelize. Uh, I'm, I'm, that's not my gift. I'm not. How are you going to be a preacher and you can't evangelize? If you're a preacher, the gospel is what you have been called to preach. And you, whether you preach it in the pulpit or preach it on the street or preach it in somebody's front door, you should go. I'm, I'm sorry, I got off on a tangent there. But what I'm trying to say is, Humble yourself and God will lift you up in due season. God will lift you up. And many of our, our, our ministers, even in our own, my own church, they've come up that same way. And God has lifted them up in due season. God lifted them up. God moved them on. Uh, many have gone on to be pastors. And even as of late, my youth pastor, about a year, a little over a year ago now, God, he was faithful. He, he did whatever, I, whatever needed to be done. He jumped right in and he helped out. He handled this, he handled that. Boom, he humbled himself under his pastoral leadership and God raised him up in due time and now he's pastoring. And so and that's how it works. That's how God's kingdom works. You can't just jump out there and tell me, I got this. No, there's a plan. There's a training. There's a process that God has and God does the lifting up. You lift yourself up, he will humble you, okay? So he says, therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, casting all, and he'll exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. So watch this. Even as you're humbling yourself under the other leadership, and even if you don't agree with the leadership, and even if you're having to suffer, listen, even if you're having to suffer under that leadership or under that scenario that you're going through, even if you're suffering under that government that you're living in, if you're suffering in that community that you're living in, if you're suffering under that system that you're living in, guess what? The text gives us some resolution here. It says, cast all your cares upon him. That's on Christ. If you're suffering, even as even as we're dealing with all the racial tension and all the racial stuff, and I mean, even the, the case yesterday, it just brought up a lot, you know, brought up a lot in, in people um, when the verdict and things were, writ, were, were spoken. But guess what? The sufferings that we have in the midst of, of a racist society and culture that we fight on a regular basis Cast your care on him. He cares for you. He knows. Because when God died on the cross, he did not die for any particular color of people. He died for his people. He died for black and white and Asian and Hispanic and, 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 and all the varieties. Any, everything I didn't, whatever I didn't say. Um, he died for everyone. And, and, and the thing about it is, listen, if, if he died for everyone, that means he cares for everyone. That means there's value in everyone. He didn't die any less for the white or any less for the black or any less for the Hispanic or any less for the Asian. And we got all these issues going on and people running around, they, they're hurting Asian people and all that. Come on, let's, let's, be, let's get this thing right. You know, we got, we got to get things in order. And as we go through the sufferings of a wicked and perverse and sinful world, and the reason we see all these things happening, and the reason why we're going through all these tensions and stresses and racisms and, and negativities, it all has to do with sin. And as we go through and live through this sinful world, we suffer. But while we're suffering, cast your care on him. Why? Because he cares for you. I can, tell, I can tell the president, I can tell the, the pastor, I can tell the, the congressman, I can tell the senator, I can tell everybody, but they may not care for me. I know he cares for me and I can cast my care on him because he cares for me. That's how you know he cares for me. He died for me. That's how I know he cares. He died for me. Whew, Lord Jesus. So I can cast my care on him. I can take all my burdens to him. I can lay all my, my problems on him. I can lay the problems of my, my home, my family, my marriage, my ministry, my job, my career, my money, my, my everything, whatever, whatever, my health, whatever it is. I can cast it all on him. And guess what? He never gets tired. 
of receiving my care, my cares. He cares for me. He loves me so much that he says, just keep bringing it. Just keep bringing it. I'll take care of you. I got you because I care for you. And so we can bring, cast all of our cares on him. We can unload our burden. It, the whole idea of casting your care is, is, is the idea and concept of unloading the weight and putting the weight on him. Taking the yoke off. Take my, he says, take my yoke upon me. Learn of me. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. So take off the heavy one you have and, and then exchange it for mine. Because I care for you. And so he calls us to that as we, as we go through suff the suffering of the believer. We cast our care on him for he cares for us. Be sober, be vigilant. Okay? Be sober, be vigilant because, and this is a great warning here, be sober, that means be attentive, be vigilant. Um, don't, don't, don't be drunk. Don't be drunk with the wine of the world. Don't be carried about with the spirits of the world. Be sober, be attentive, be vigilant. Why? Because the adversary, your adversary, the devil, your adversary, the one who is against you, the devil, you specifically, the devil, he walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He's looking for someone he can tear apart. So guess what? If you're walking through the woods and you, you think it's just regular old woods and ain't nothing happening there, then you're just going to walk through the woods like ooh, 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 you know, whistling Dixie, having a great old time. But if you know it's a lion in the woods, you're going to walk a little differently. So I want you to know something. There's a lion in the woods that you walk in every day. Your adversary. He's a roaring lion. He's, he's, he's like a roaring lion, like a roaring, roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. He's looking for you. He's looking for opportunity to rip you into shreds and tear you apart. Well, in the context of all this, guess what? Some of that happens because, because I'm not humbling myself under the leadership that's ahead of me. Some of it happens because I'm exalting myself. Some of it, some of it happens because I'm full of pride and, and, and I'm, 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 I'm full of pride instead of humility. But guess what? Because when I'm, when I'm doing that, I'm putting myself outside the will of God. I'm outside the will of God. I'm more vulnerable now to my adversary. My adversary is looking for opportunity to take me out. Okay? So he, he encourages, he, he gives warning. Be sober, be vigilant for the, your adversary, the devil. He walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Resist him. Resist him. He's coming for you, but resist him. Push away from him. Resist him. Steadfast in the faith. Wow. This is good because what it means, first of all, it means you have to be in the faith to resist the devil. You cannot resist the devil if you're not in the faith. Okay? If I'm not in the faith, there's no, no resistance to the devil. I can't push away. I have no faith to push away when I'm not, you know, if, if I'm not in Christ, I can't push away. So, Here's this roaring lion seeking human may devour, may devour. He says, resist him steadfastly, constantly, ongoingly. Resist him in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. Wow. So he's, he's going at everybody. He ain't just, it's not just you. He's going at everybody. But resist steadfastly in faith. In the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brothers who are in the world. So we're not the only ones that suffer. The others are suffering too, okay? I, you ever notice like sometimes when you're going through, it, it, it feels like you're the only one. It feels like everybody else is doing great. When, when you're going through something, I mean, you're, you, you, you know, you got bill problems or you got health problems or, you know, you got whatever is going on, marriage problems or you got, you know, household issues or your car ain't running right. It, it, it just kind of seemed like at that time when you're going through and you, you kind of burned down with it, it you look around just looking at everybody else happy, you know, everybody holding hands, everybody, everybody's life looks like it's wonderful, and it looks like you're the only one. That's, that's part of the trick of the devil. That's part of the, the roaring lion strategy to cause you to believe you all by yourself. Lord, have mercy. That's why it's good for us to know I can cast my care on him because he cares for me. And, and watch this. So he's looking for opportunity to, to seek. He's seeking opportunity to, to devour you. We got to resist him. We got to resist his strategies. We got to resist his encouragements to do wrong. And to walk away from God, we got to resist him steadfastly, constantly, ongoingly in the faith. Wow. 
knowing that the same sufferings are being endured by other people. Other, can I tell you something? Other people going through too. You are not the only one. Watch this. Some of the folk you're looking at and they look nice, got all the nice clothes and all that. They ain't got no money. They broke too. Okay? Some of the people that, as you know, you're looking at, you say, oh, wow, they, they look so healthy. They got problems too. They got, the doctor just told them they need surgery. They got this going on. They got going on. Everybody got stuff going on. Everybody got some measure of suffering that they're going through. Some, some is mental. Some is physical. Some is psychological. You know, they got, they got problems too. I, I'm just, I'm kind of bust them. I'll bust the bubble of the devil. Because he wants you to believe you are the only one that's going through what you're going through. I stop by and let you know you are not the only one. Amen, praise the Lord, somebody. Somebody needs to say amen right about there. You're not the only one. So your brother's going through other things too. Other countries they're going through. Other cities they're going through. Other states they're going through. Other churches they're going through. You know, your church ain't the only one that got problems and got stuff going on. Other places got stuff going. Everybody, people in different places, suffering's going on all over. Because we're living in a sin-sick society. It's loaded with sufferings. Okay? We're not the only ones. So resist the devil's thought process to cause you to believe you are the only one. Resist him. Okay? And we know that once you resist the devil, he will flee. Okay? And he comes back and he says, look, may God, may, yeah, but, May the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while. This is what this is. I, I like personally, I like this text. I like that just that right there, that verse. The whole verse I like. I like it, but I know most people don't like it because they like, uh uh, no, uh -uh, I don't want no suffering. I don't want to go through nothing. Listen to what he says again. He says, but you got the devil after you. He's trying to, he's, he's trying to devour you. He's seeking to devour you. You need to resist. You need, you need to understand other people are suffering too. All that's going on. But here's, here's, here's what I want you to focus on. He says, but may the God of all grace, all grace. What that means is, God is able to extend in whatever your suffering situation is, grace. May that God, the one who is able to extend all grace, grace in any situation, the one who called us mm, 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 to his eternal glory, the God that called us, he beckoned us out of darkness, come out of darkness into the marvelous light. That God, may that God after you have suffered for a while. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait, wait. You, you, you didn't give me an option. No, there's no option regarding suffering. You will suffer. After, may that God, after you have suffered a while. What's a while? A while is the time that God determines we need to go through it. Mm. For some, that while is a couple of days. For some, that while is a couple of years. For, for some, that while may be many years. But after you have suffered for that season, for that while, he says, may that God who has all grace, may that God who called us to his eternal glory. So in other words, we are going somewhere. We're not going, we're not going to the suffering. We're going through the suffering to his eternal glory. Because he's called us to his eternal glory. So he's called us to, to get to the place where we reach his eternal glory. May that God, after you've suffered a while, may he perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. May that God, this is, this is, this is an awesome, awesome encouragement from Peter. May that God who is able to do all these things, may he perfect you. May he establish and strengthen you. May he settle you after you've gone through. Man, who doesn't want that? I, I'll take it. If I have to go through, oh yeah, let him strengthen me. Yes, 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 I want that. Yeah, let him settle me. I got. I need to settle. I need him to settle me. Let, give me some peace. May, I need that grace. May that God who has all the grace, I need him to bring it after I have gone through my suffering for a while. 
And this is one of the reasons why we're able, watch this, we're able to keep going in this life because even though we all go through suffering, God, by his grace, brings us through it and brings us down to a place of settling. And we settle for a while. He might go through some more suffering. And then he brings you through it and you settle for a while. He strengthens you so you can keep going in the journey. We don't just go through suffering and then stop and that's it. No, we keep going. So it's that grace from God that allows us to keep going. May he keep on giving you strength. May he keep on establishing you and perfecting you. Because as you're going through your struggles, as you're going through your suffering, God is perfecting you through your struggle. You know what some of our biggest problem is that needs perfecting? We have no patience. So we need to go through some things so we can grow some patience. Now, I know. Listen, I'm talking to somebody right now. The reason why you're going through and it hasn't ended yet, because God is working on your patience. He's trying to grow you in patience as you're going through. Oh, Pastor, you shouldn't have said that. Hey, I'm trying to help you. Because there's no other way for him to grow you in patience if you keep getting everything as soon as you click your finger. If I get everything like that, I'm never going to have any patience. If I don't have to go through, if I don't have to suffer through, I'm, I, I'm not going to grow my patience. I won't have any. I want to quick, fast, and hurry. Hurry up. I got to give it right now. And that's part of the reason why we need to suffer. We need to go through to grow in patience. And what, what was Peter writing all about anyway? He was, he was writing all about patience and suffering. So we can gain the patience through the suffering that we go through. So he says, look, may that God bless you, establish you, strengthen and perfect you, settle you. To him, this is his doxology, to him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. To him, to him belongs the glory. To him belongs dominion. In other words, he's the ruler, he's the king, he's the super, he's the super God, he's the high authority, he's above the elder, he's above the leader, he's the utmost, he is the grand uh, potentate, he is the supreme God, he's the one that's above it all. To him belongs all the glory, all the dominion, all the power, forever and ever. Amen. That's, that's, how, that's how he reels it in. So he helps you understand. It's all about him. It's all about God. So then he comes back and gives us this kind of fi some final salutation by Silvanus, our faithful brother. As I consider him, I have written uh, to you briefly, exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God in which you stand. So just a little salutation um, as he closing out, she who is in Babylon, elect together with you. And then we talk about the, the elect. That's those that are chosen together with you. Others that are in the regions of Babylon who have chosen together with you to be called saints, that be called um, to salvation and to be called to eternal life to, to them and to her. He addresses as her. Um, uh, the elect together with you. Greet you in... And so does Mark, my son. So salutations being shared from those, you know, kind of, uh, I almost want to say kind of as a missional, uh, I was over here, I talked to him. Oh, he said, when, he, when, when I see you, tell you, tell you hello. And, and so he's passing around those greetings uh, like that. And then he says, um, even as all those greetings go about, he shares all those greetings, he comes back and he says, now, uh, greet one another uh, with a kiss of love, Okay. Uh, this is how he encourages them to greet each other with a kiss of love. Guess what? Guess what? Uh, I, I never thought about this until I was really looking at it through the lens of patience and suffering. Why do we need this greeting of, of, of a kiss um, of love? Uh, well, because when you're suffering, isn't it good to have somebody give you a hug and encourage you and, and, and give you a kiss and just let you know, I love you? Wow. Because guess what? We then become instruments of God to remind the person who's suffering that God loves them. You know what? Sometimes, I, and I've heard, I've heard a lot of single people say this. They say, you know, um, now I'm, well, I'm, they say, I need a mate. Women, they'll say, I need a man. And so Jesus is your man. So yeah, when they'll say, yeah, I got Jesus, but I need a man that I can touch. I need a man that can touch me back. I need to feel him. Okay. And, I, and, and you know, I'm thinking, okay, I, I understand. I get that. Um, so in a sense, when we're being encouraged, 
we become vessels of God to encourage each other with a hug, with an encouragement, um, with a kiss. That in essence, as ambassadors of Christ, I'm kissing you on behalf of Christ. I'm greeting you with a kiss. I'm greeting you with love on behalf of Christ. And so now we get a chance to feel from an earthly person that welcome, that kiss, that greeting um, of, with love. And he says, peace to you all who are in Christ Jesus. Amen. That's how he closes out this book of First Peter. Okay? Um, I think it's awesome, 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 especially in the context of teaching us patience and suffering. And in this final chapter, as he specifically talks about all this, the sufferings of the believer, what the believer has to go through, it gives a, a direction. It gives uh, an a, a, a order in which we can navigate suffering and come out on top, okay? Through submission to the leadership, uh, through respectful and appropriate leadership, leading, leaders leading, uh, shepherding the flock, uh, under under shepherds understanding their role their responsibility their accountability that they will be held to but then those that are younger those that are not in the leadership position those that are members those that are followers they're they're falling in line and and uh submitting even though they don't understand they don't get it all they're still submitting because they're literally submitting to the powerful hand of god and the hand of god is the hand that is literally bringing about the suffering or allowing a certain level of suffering Watch this, so that you can grow in patience, okay? But be sober, be alert, because we don't want you to fall into areas where the your enemy, your adversary, the devil, can cause more suffering and more headache and more than you are, are I want to say, entitled to or that you need to, okay? Uh, and so watch out for him, because he's out there. Like a roaring lion looking for someone he can devour. Don't let that be you. So stay sober, stay vigilant, uh, watch out for him. And when you see him and you see his antics and his tricks coming, resist him. Okay? In the faith, resist him. And, and so he's laid all that out for us. And he gives us this, this closing doxology and says, hey, all of it goes to him. All the glory belongs to God, to him, all the glory, all the dominion. But he has called us. Through all of this, he's going to keep us through all of this, and he will bless us as we go through it. So, patience and suffering, as we get the right mental perspective and glean from what Peter has laid out here in the text, boom, we can have an enormity of patience in our suffering. Amen? All right, well, that's our Bible study for tonight. Um, great study in First Peter. We'll pick up next um, time. It, actually, next week, we actually have a church business meeting on uh, next Wednesday night. So that will be for members only and we will get an invitation for our members uh, for that meeting if, if you haven't already and go ahead and register for the, the church business meeting. So we will not have a uh, Wednesday night Bible study next Wednesday. However, the following Wednesday, we will be back together and we'll pick up in 2 Peter. We'll have a quick little quiz on 1 Peter. Not a whole lot, but I've repeated over and over again the things that you need to know, three word summary, the outline of the book. Blah, blah, blah. I'll pull a couple of other questions out of there, but you'll get it. It'll be, it'll be easy. It'll be quick. And we'll move through that. And then we'll go on into second Peter, uh, in two weeks. All right. So looking forward to uh, seeing you on Friday night for the Friday night chat and just trying to work to get some other things in place. Uh, as we move on in, believe it or not, we're moving on through April, almost over, almost into May, moving towards mother's day, believe it or not, my God. So get ready, get ready, get ready. As we approach May, and hopefully weather shifts to where we are stopped getting snow and things begin to look a little, little bit better on the warmer side. All right, that's all I have for this evening, ladies and gentlemen. I appreciate you guys hanging out with us. I want to pray for you uh, before we leave. I believe that's critically important uh, for those that are, are online as well as those that will tune in later. I want to lift you up before the Lord. I believe we need it. Father, in your name, we come before you this evening. We bless you. We honor you. We thank you because you're God all by yourself. You don't need help from anyone. And Lord, we've come tonight to cast our care on you. Even as we've read tonight, we've learned in the scripture, you can, we can do that because you care for us. There's no limitation of what we can cast on you. Lord, you said cast our care. What is our care? Our care is the things that weigh us down, the burdens, the weight, the struggles that we're having. 
Some of us, God, may be struggling in our finances. I pray they cast it on you. And Lord, as they cast it on you, they, they literally are thrusting it away from themselves such that they can't retrieve it. And so I'm praying that when they, when they cast it on you, God, that they leave it with you and allow you to take care of it. Father, others are dealing with health concerns. They're praying for their family members. They're praying for their moms, dads, sisters, brothers, cousins, relatives, neighbors, friends, co-workers. God, and tonight we want to cast our care for them on you. We want to cast our concerns about our health, our cares and our concerns about recovery and surgery. We want to cast it on you. We want to thrust it away from our worry. We want to thrust it away from our mindset that it might not return, that we might not try to fix it ourselves, but we cast it away that it belongs to you because you care for us. So we're trusting you, Lord, with our troubles. We're trusting you with our heartaches, our headaches, our grief. We're casting, we're, we're, we're casting our cares and concerns about decisions we have before us to be made. So for many, God, they've got decisions ahead of them. They've got to decide one thing or another. They've got so many choices, God, and they need to know which one is right. So I pray, Lord, you lead and guide them in the right choice. I pray, Heavenly Father, that those that are wrestling in their, their families and they're dealing with their children and their spouses, God, that they can cast that care on you, understanding and realizing you care for them. And at the same time, God, I pray that they not forget that the enemy is still out there seeking whom he may devour. He's seeking to devour leaders. He's seeking to devour families. He's seeking to, de to take out those, Lord God, who have the responsibility and accountability for God's flock. And I'm praying, God, tonight that you would give strength and grace and pour it out on behalf of those who are willing to humble themselves. The humility may, may actually literally mean it doesn't go our way, but we're willing to humble ourselves that your will will be done and your way will be accomplished however you choose to make it happen. So, Spirit of the Lord, I pray for those families tonight. I pray for those children tonight. I pray, God, for those families who are dealing with the losses of loved ones. Father, even the multitude of mass killings, I'm praying for those multitudes of families for those that are going and dealing with issues with the police departments and all kinds of things that are going on, I just lift them up before you. And God, we fail not to forget that we're in the middle of a pandemic and still many are hospitalized, still many are dying, still many are contracting the virus. Lord God, I lift all of them up before you and all of the cares and all of the concerns. I cast it on you. And we're trusting you tonight, Lord God, that you would work it out to your honor and to your glory. And in the midst of our suffering, in the midst of us going through, God, you would grow us in patience so we might have patience in and through our suffering, realizing that we're in journey, we're en route to a glorious God, that we might obtain the glory of God that you've already set before us. So Lord, these are our requests tonight. Those that have been spoken, I'm sure there are many others that are unspoken. You know them all. You know every need. You know every situation. I cast it on you and ask you to care for your children the way only a parent and a omnipotent God can do. In Jesus' name I pray and I thank you. Amen and amen. All right. Thank you guys for hanging out. I hope you enjoyed the study tonight. I believe it's just uh, so rich, so much power in it just for, for everyone to glean something from. I appreciate you. I'm looking forward to moving forward as we keep on studying, keep on digging in the word of God. Don't give up. Don't, don't throw in the towel. God cares for you. Cast your care on him. Amen. Have a good night, everybody. Love you.